Hello and welcome to another Fantasy Premier League video. My name is Steve and I got 9 out of the 11 starters in my Man City predicted lineup last week correct, which isn't too bad for my first attempt. But there was a key substitution that Pep made that has provided us, provided us with some deeper insights into Lewis's role within the team and why I think he will continue to start with very little threat in the way of rotation. Spurs as a defensive unit were at times playing like schoolboys, so we go into exactly what went wrong and why I've put Pedro Porro down on the transfer list for game week 9 if Spurs show similar signs again next game week. And I'll also go into a little bit of detail about Brennan Johnson and why I don't rate his finishing, even though he did score a very nice goal with his weak foot at the weekend. So remember to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel, especially if you get any value out of the following content. All right, so start off with the Foden and Lewis predictions. Now, last week I did predict Foden would start his first Premier League match, and we did get that one right on the money. Probably not too out there of a prediction to get right, as he had started in the Champions League midweek, so we were aware that he was back fit and ready. And I did say I was about 90% certain that Foden would start his first Premier League game against Fulham. And in fact, I did get the whole team correct, apart from just two players. Now, I did predict Walker to get benched instead of Guardiola, which is why I ha sorry, I predicted Guardiola to get benched instead of Walker, uh, which is why I had Lewis down as an inverting left back for the Fulham fixture. Now, Lewis was actually playing on the right as a CDM CM and we'll go into a little bit more of that because I don't actually think he was an inverting right back in this game at all. So Gvardiol did in fact start his third game in a calendar week with Walker on the bench so that was one of the predictions I did get wrong. I also predicted Savio at right wing and I should have really put down Bernardo Silva in that position, considering Savio had played the Champions League uh, match midweek and Silva hadn't actually played for a little bit. So that one I probably should have got right. Apologies for anyone out here who took that one to heart as Bernardo Silva did come away with some returns this weekend. However, I don't think he is really a long-term FPL prospect. But we did pick up some learnings from this Fulham and City fixture. Now, last week I did say that City were had a lot less control in the middle of the park without Rodri on the pitch. There was actually similar signs in this Fulham fixture in the game week just gone. Now, in the match, the Fulham match, Adama Traore was the man who got pretty much all of Fulham's big chances. He was coming down their left-hand side of the pitch, which was Man City's right-hand side of the pitch, which is actually another reason why I thought Lewis might be across at left-back to allow Walker to deal with the pace and strength of Adama Traore, uh, but that's by the by. Now, Lewis wasn't really reverting into right back when City lost possession. And given Lewis was the closest man to Adama Traore during his big chances, so there was the one where uh, they both went into a foot race and Lewis got in front of him, but then he tried to play the man instead of playing the ball and uh, Adama nipped around him and got another big chance. There was another one where the cross came in from the right hand side I think and then Lewis was trying to get back to Marcus Armour and Adama just needed to clip it over the keeper but ended up going right over the top of the goal and so with Lewis being the closest man to Adama I thought he just wasn't reverting far enough into right back or quick enough and so I assumed that he was probably the man at fault and responsible for marking Adama uh, Traore. And so I was expecting Pep to sub Lewis off for Walker. However, 
the key piece of information that we did pick up was that Pep brought on Walker for a kanji in the 62nd minute to nullify Fulham's main threat in Ajdama Traore. Now, bringing Walker on for a kanji actually indicates that he thought a kanji wasn't dealing with Adama well enough. And so he put the pace and strength of Walker in there instead to nullify Fulham's main threat. So long story short, I think Pep is looking at Lewis as a pure CDM slash central midfielder, so like a six or an eight, that also pops up in cam positions, which we've been seeing all season, but with very little in the way of responsibilities for covering the right back area of the pitch. Now this means we could see Walker, Gvardio and Lewis all on the pitch at the same time. And from memory, I think we have actually already seen that once this season. Now, Gvardio will definitely need a rest at some point, especially when there are some more midweek fixtures. But I'm wondering if Pep is actually waiting for Nathan Ake to get back from injury before he goes to rest Gvardio is it doesn't look like he's actually going to be putting Lewis back there, even though he did try that much earlier in the season. In fact, it was the last Champions League, uh, the last fixture prior to the last Champions League match where Lewis started as an inverting left back in front of Covario. So I think Lewis's minutes are actually pretty secure moving forward. I mean, we could still see Lewis go in and start ahead of Guardiol if Guardiol really does need a rest and is, you know, starting to get a little bit of fatigue in the legs or, or something like that. But I think he might actually be make, waiting more for Arcade to come back before giving Guardiol a bit of a wrench, a rest, which I think means Lewis's starts are probably pretty secure as he's also playing very well in the center of the park now it was a bit of a week for rotation as there was quite a few notable benchings um, from first teamers uh, liverpool for example diaz was benched in favor of gakpo this weekend after they had played their champions league games midweek soboslai was also benched in favor of jones playing in the cam role which is something i haven't seen too often Robertson was also on the bench in favour of Simakas. So that whole left-hand side was actually rotated in that Liverpool starting lineup. Now, Jota did come back to start again, but I actually still think he is first choice. And even though Nunes got a start in game week six, I think it was, or seven, six, or, uh, got a start in six, five or six, uh, I do think Jota is uh, first choice up front. And of course, Canade does continue to start, which is validating my game week three choice to bring him into my team and invest in him. But Allison did do his hammy in the game. He was actually, he took his gloves off straight away and threw them into the ground in frustration, which means he will likely be out for the next four to eight calendar weeks, depending on the grade of the pull assuming it is a pull of his hamstring i haven't actually caught up on uh, exactly what kind of information has come out there all i got was in game where he did come off the pitch and tell arnie slot that yep it was his hammy but i don't think this will be enough for me to ditch canade but we will need to keep an eye on how yaros plays as he was the man subbed in for allison uh, in that match and also in the same match, a really weird benching, which I do not understand at all, was uh, Glasner benched Mateta in favour of Inkeria, which, I mean, that's a super tough game for Inkeria to get his first run out in that number nine position. I don't really understand it because surely they need someone up front that's going to be able to hold up the ball, someone like Mateta. I do not at all understand that. But anyway, there was quite a lot of rotation in uh, uh, in the fixtures this weekend, which is for those teams with the Champions League. And this is why I had predicted Lewis to start out of position at left back. 
uh, for the weekend's fixtures. Right, so Spurs were a calamity in defence. Now Spurs were actually up 2-0 at half time against Brighton. They managed to concede three goals in the first 20 minutes of the second half to lose the game. Now their defending has been a little bit suspect for a while, but the third goal in this fixture shows just how poorly the whole team is defending as a unit. This was not just one error from one person. I actually counted eight separate Spurs players who all made individual mistakes in this goal. I mean, that's pretty much the whole team here. So in the 66th minute, Welbeck scored uh, from Rutter's assist. Now, Rutter was the man that actually did all of the hard work here. Welbeck was just the man on the spot who nodded home. So Rutter gets out of a three-on-one situation with Werner, Madison, and Udogi all surrounding him. Now, all Rutter does is a simple drag back 180 to turn away from both Werner and Madison. And as soon as he does that, both Werner and Madison then just stood there and ball watched, just watched Rutter run away. Udogi, who was part of the three men uh, shutting him down, did get a challenge in, but the ball kind of deflected around as he put the uh, challenge in, deflected back off Rutter and in line with his run. And as soon as that happened, Udo Udogi then stopped and watched the ball, so didn't even bother chasing it down. Now, Benton Core did come across to correctly uh, go after the ball that had ping-ponged out of the challenge that Udogi put in. Uh, and he should have just tapped the ball dead, but instead he tried to shepherd, shepherd the ball out. So that was a bit of a mistake. Rutter, who had scrambled to get to the ball before it went dead, slides and clips the ball into the center of the six-yard box. Now close to him was also Van de Ven, who chose not to close down the space, which allowed all the room for Rutter's cross. So Bentoncourt didn't tap the ball out. Van de Ven didn't go in and, and close down the space. Vicario did correctly get across to his near post, which is about the most basic of goalkeeping positioning here, so not something we should really be saying well done for or anything. But his reaction time to the cross is super delayed, and instead of recognising that Welbeck was free and coming out to close down his shooting angle, Vicario instead goes sideways to the centre of the goal to create huge areas of the goal for Danny Welbeck to shoot at. And on top of all of this, Danny Welbeck is standing alone in the center of the goal, just five yards out, with both Romero and Pedro Porro, each with a, within about a meter away of Danny Welbeck. But both of them were just rooted to the spot and we're still ball watching Rutter and not even recognizing that they should be picking up the only man free in the center of the goal. Now, Welbeck, I mean, it was a perfect cross and Welbeck did nod home from about five yards out, but that was about eight different mistakes for across the whole team there with a lot of ball watching and absolutely no urgency when Brighton were in dangerous areas or a dangerous attacking areas within the pitch. So I am now seriously starting to question whether Pedro Porro is going to be worth it across this run of fixtures. Yes, he does still have some attacking threat, but there's just no hope of clean sheets if the team continues to defend like this. There was no defensive urgency or recognizing the danger Super lazy players all over the place, not sprinting after men who beat them, and a complete line of defenders who were all ball watching when, I mean, the guy Rudder is in the perfect place to just cut back a 45 degree angle cross, and that goal is just pretty much always scored in football matches. It was calamitous, so... 
if I see anything like this again in the first game after the international break from the Spurs unit, Porro will be out of my team. Right, and Brennan Johnson. So we'll just go through a couple of match notes for Brennan Johnson. So he did score a goal in the 23rd minute, which was assisted by Solanke. Now this is a beautifully weighted through ball by Solanke for Johnson, who had made a great run in behind the defensive line. Now Johnson does hit a first time side footed shot on his weak foot to beat the keeper in at the nearer post, which was a pretty well taken finish. But although it was a great finish, this, the shot was set up so perfectly by where Solanke put the ball and the amount of weight that he put on it to perfectly intercept Johnson's run, that there's really nothing else to do for Brennan Johnson but to pass the ball with the side of his weak foot into the wide open space at the near post. So it was the it was the obvious shot, it was the easiest shot to take, and because it's on his weak foot, he is likely going to go for the easiest shot, which all kind of makes sense, right? But in the 44th minute, Johnson gets his shot horribly wrong, hitting it high and central. So even if it was on target, it would have gone straight down the keeper's throat. Now, this is where I think Brennan Johnson's uh, finishing is quite poor so he hit this ball with the side of his foot but he hit it up near the toes which is pretty much always going to send the ball high or has a much higher likelihood of sending the ball high if you don't get the ball exactly in the center uh, when you make contact now to make matters worse the ball is slightly bouncing making this choice of shot one of the hardest well one of the hardest to finish to be honest now if we go to someone else in the league just as a bit of a segue to uh darwin nunez who last season came down he was going through a horror run of just not being able to finish and i think it was his first goal that he actually scored in a long time he bore down on goal and he sends his shot one, he's one-on-one -on -one with the keeper. <laughs> Instead of trying to go around the keeper or slot it past him or try to meg him, he goes for one of the hardest shots, which is like kind of a chip over the top of an advancing keeper with the ball moving at pace. And now he did score the goal, but as soon as he put that as his shot selection and he actually took that shot, even though he scored it, I immediately discounted him ever from any of my FPL teams because... He's just taking the low the low percentage shots when he's in huge goal scoring position. So this is kind of what Johnson has done in this situation. Now, what he should have done was being was to put his laces through that ball, and that way he can strike through the center of the ball vertically. So if the ball's bouncing, it's like bobbling along the ground, and you've got a ball like this. When you line up your foot, and this is the laces, this is the ball, you've got all of this to strike through, and you can hit like anywhere in the center down the ball, and you're going to get a shot on target, which is much easier to do when the ball is bouncing. Now, if the ball is not rolling along the ground, hitting the ball with the side of the foot means that you need to hit it in the center horizontally, and that horizontal is changing as the ball is bouncing. So yes, you can hit it in the center of the ball there, but it is much harder to do because you have to time it as the ball is kind of bouncing across the across the ground like that. So he's chosen one of the toughest shots to take on there. And he hits it off the toes <laughs> as well. So he doesn't even connect with the right part of the foot. And because he's trying to use the instep of his foot as well, that always induces swing, which will actually take the ball away from the far post, which is really where you should be aiming. I mean, you can go near post there, but if you're going to hit near post, you have to hit it with heaps of power to get it past the keeper before they have time to react, because the near post, they're going to be able to get to much quicker than any area of the goal that you aim for at the far post. All the goals, most of all the goals that go in, 
high percentage of them are all low, hard, along the ground, and at the far post. So if he's using the instep of his foot there, wide on the right, trying to go for that far post with in-swing taking it away from the far post, you basically have to aim it at the keeper, hope it swings enough before it gets to the keeper to take it out of his range of holding onto it, but doesn't swing enough so that it still goes in at the far post. Now, this is why I don't rate him very much as a finisher. So yes, Johnson will still score goals like the one he did this weekend, and he will get some tap-ins as well, like he has already earlier in the season. But he will be a very hit-and-miss type of player, and he would be way down my list on anyone that I would bring into my FPL team. There would have to be a lot of other injuries to other players before I would consider him. Now, just very quickly before we tie this video off, I think we should definitely be targeting Brighton and Wolves for any of our attackers very quickly on Brighton. Now, I didn't actually get a chance yet to sit down and watch this whole game, but at the end of the game, the commentator did say that it was a first half full of high lines and low points, but a second half that saw a stunning comeback for Brighton. Now, what this means to me is that Herzler clearly didn't learn anything from the Chelsea fixture last week in the high line that he put up against Chelsea, starting again with the high line against Spurs, who also have a couple of very rapid players in their attacking unit. And so any decent enough team is going to break that high line very easily, and I think there will be much more chances going in against the Bruggen in the coming game weeks. <clears throat> Doesn't look like Herzl is going to ask his high line to drop back. And also to target Wolves. Now this is the second time this season that Wolves have shipped five or more goals. In fact, they've shipped at least two goals in every single fixture so far this season, apart from the one all draw against Forest in game week three. Now, what I did say in my last video last week was this was Salah's last week in my team as I banked the additional transfer to have three free transfers to come back to after the international break. And my planned move of Salah to Foden is still looking extremely tempting for when we return as Man City will be taking on Wolves in game week eight. And all right, well, that wraps up this video. So don't forget to like and subscribe and leave us a comment to tell us what you think. Thanks for watching and I'll see you all again next time.